<laughs> All right, guys, here we go. We've got episode 147. We've got US Bob Sledder, Blaine McConnell here. Blaine, welcome to the show. I'm Oscar this is Angus. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. Thanks for having me. And uh, welcome. We're at the SCG, the Sydney Cricket Ground. Nice. Yeah, that, I saw a little screenshot from a podcast you did previously, and I was like, that's a pretty sick studio. It makes us <laughs> seem more legit than we are. Yeah. Um, this is actually a <laughs> training center for a e- Australian esports team. So the guys yeah. just play League of Legends here all day. And a few other games. A few other games. Nice. You guys will probably appreciate my roommate back there gaming real hard right now. What's he playing? What's he playing? Uh, I think he's on Overwatch. Yeah, nice. No, they play Overwatch here too. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, mate, I've I've obviously done my research on you recently, and you're probably the most pa- all-rounded, powerful athlete we've had on the show. Because the I- only person in terms of well-roundedness that would come close would be Marcus Philly, who is you're way stronger athlete. than him. Correct. Like, he's very well-rounded I'm- and. Moves beautiful, I'm but way stronger than Marcus Philly, <laughs> <laughs> dude. And he he was our most downloaded episode up until this year, so maybe you'll give him a run. We do have a very prestigious guest of the year, uh, which is there's a bell, know, mate. You might be in contention. Our our listeners do like CrossFit athletes, so and you you're late in the year, which is very important for voting. True, I get the the last votes there. I, yeah. I only say that about Marcus too, because we're actually we're good friends, so I like to tease him about that. Nice, nice. So, I'm, I'm, can I throw some numbers at you, which I've heard uh, when I've done my research on yourself? Confirm uh, or confirm deny. Confirm or deny. So, a four, <laughs> right. a low four three forty yard dash. That is correct. Yes. What what time? Uh, I was like hand time. It was four twos, but laser. I ran a four three zero. That wow. is lightning, and that was at a regional combine, correct? That was yeah. How heavy are you? Uh, right now, I'm right about 100 kilos. But at the time of that oh, sprint? Oh, at that time, I was probably like 94 kilos or so. I was a lot lighter then. But still, that's still pretty hectic. Like It's so fucking hectic. I remember Bolt, I was having a look. Someone posted the other day, just they tracked his season PBs with his weight gain throughout his career. And man, he was really slowing down once he got up around like 94, 96 kilos. So I think you're doing well, mate. <laughs> and then... Uh, the next would be an 11 foot 9 broad jump. That is true. And at the same combine? Because you went to a regional combine, yeah? Yeah, I went to a regional combine. That was actually, I did a combine for arena football, and the 11 foot 9 happened at that combine. Nice. And then a 46 inch vert? Yeah, also the, the vert came at that arena combine. That, dude, that's mad. Some that is solid stats. Mad. I guess, can. Because, I, again, I've watched a few YouTube clips on you and you were speaking how you got into strength and conditioning and it came after you were sort of training uh, with someone for the combine and then you sort of went to arena football and you started coaching. Who was your coach at the time? Who got you powerful for that? And how specific were you training for that combine? Like, do you forget football-specific practice and just focus on those particular, uh, I guess, events? Yeah, um, in college, like we, I basically just stuck around our strength and conditioning coach uh, when I was at University of Idaho. Um, at the time, it was Coach Gadigan, who I think is now at like the IMG Academy. Um, but after that, like when I I didn't get looked at for the NFL or like any professional leagues really out of college, so I started just reading up on stuff and kind of training for myself. And I've always enjoyed training to be strong and powerful. Um, so, like, the first couple things I f- came across was, like, Yuri Voroshenky's books. I started reading into those and started implementing, like, depth jumps and doing different things. And then how to kind of transition that into, like, speed. And then found Cal Dietz and started doing triphasic training. And then uh, was just going through, like, coach after coach and just picking and choosing here and there what worked for me and what didn't, what I liked. Um, so, like, training for, like, the arena stuff, I basically kind of did on my own it was just kind of throwing things together and seeing what worked yeah nice and then post i guess arena football which no one really seems to stick with for long because it really sounds like a hard slog especially if you have your sights set on the nfl uh yeah was it straight into because then i believe you started crossfit and then bob sled from there like i sorry i guess a better question is just take us through your athletic journey yeah so college football um, after football in college, there was probably a year gap um, where I didn't really play anything. I wasn't pursuing anything. Uh, and then arena football came around. I trained for that combine. 
uh, went through that process, played arena football for one year, uh, didn't really like it at all. The, the game from indoor to outdoor is so different, um, especially I was playing on the defensive side. So the rules were set up in a way where like the defense was at a disadvantage because they want the scores to be 70 to 70 and have like a high score type thing. So I didn't like the arena route so much. Um, so after arena, which was, I think, 2010, um, I didn't actually start CrossFit until 2014. So that two, that four-year gap there is where I just started training other athletes. Um, I was went back to my old high school, just got a bunch of the football kids there, and started training them in their off-seasons. And then a then few of them went to college, and then I started training college kids. Uh, and now one of them is – uh, strength and conditioning coach himself at the Iowa State University. So it's nice. it's cool to kind of see like how my passion kind of grew through somebody else and did that. Um, so that was like that four year gap of just trying to train and learn as much as I could. And I started CrossFit in 2014, uh, and I started at a at a gym up near Seattle. From there, I uh, made it to regionals my first year doing CrossFit. It was pretty solid. <laughs> yeah, it was it was different because like doing crossfit in the gym and like doing the open and i I had no clue what regionals was um so i just kind of was just doing the workouts as people were doing them and going to regionals i kind of saw like the competitive side of like the sport aspect of crossfit which was really intriguing to me and being a naturally more stronger and powerful athlete crossfit didn't come easy to me so it was fun to kind of like push myself and work really hard to try to get better at something I was like actually terrible at. I bet you're glad um, you weren't at the CrossFit Games this year. They didn't even get their hands on a barbell till it was down to like the final event. Yeah, I know. I was watching the games this year. The only thing I, I would have enjoyed about the games this year is those two sprint events came before like the final cut. And mm. If I was there and something and, and those events were coming up, like I would be hands down be winning those events and it would have been fun to kind of go through that but with that being said like that first run with the backpack i probably wouldn't even have made it past that so Rapto, instant raptor <laughs> yeah uh but yeah the, the learning about the competitive side of crossfit was fun um and then i i got serious about it and uh, moved down to arizona started training with uh opex and was on site there and that's where like the grid kind of came in and I went on that professional circuit for two years uh, and then went to the games in 2016. Uh, after the games in 2016, I kind of like reached the peak of what I thought like I wanted to, to complete in CrossFit. So as soon as it was over, um, I kind of knew as soon as the, the games were over that day, I was like, I'm probably not going to be competing in CrossFit anymore. And there was a year to two year gap before I actually found bobsled. And uh, so were you still yeah, obviously yeah. staying fit, weightlifting in the bobs in like that two years, or what were you focusing on coaching? Uh, both. So I I moved to San Diego, started working at Invictus, and that's where I brought up a lot more. Like I was really focused on coaching there and just still kind of training, but I fell back into like the type of training that I like to do, which is just heavy lifting, sprints, jumps, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we were watching the Olympics in 2018 and we had a whole group of people over and bobsled happened to pop up on the television and immediately there was probably 15 people in the room and all of them looked at me and was like, you need to be bobsledding. Like <laughs> if you're not doing CrossFit, you need to go do bobsled because this is like the sport that you're born for. So I was like, all right. And then just went through the process of like trying out for, for that and made the national team last year. All right, now this is where the bombardment of questions are going to come. So I want to take you back to when Angus and I probably first got into Olympic lifting, maybe in 2013. And we're both sort of naturally skinny guys, more genetically, I guess, benefited to the endurance side of sports. We are like the lineage of persistence hunters. Correct. So of course, we want to be as strong and powerful as we can. Anyway, so then a guy I was coaching at the time, he came to us with like the US, um, the standards for bobsled athletes. So it was like uh, local, regional, and then elite. And just like the elite status was like, and this is in kilos, it was like a 220 squat, it was like a 10-foot broad. It was like a 40-inch vert, a 
like 160 power clean. Had like to be something. Filthy. The numbers were insanely athletic, and we just ran through your times. Obviously, you meet that criteria heavily. How like well does that? I guess just having that basis transfer across to your initial run on a bobsled. It actually like the combine itself and those numbers transfer over fairly evenly. Like your stronger, more powerful guys usually do well on pushing a heavy sled. Um, and that's kind of the reason why they have those specific events for their combine. Uh, a lot of it though is, you do need to be extremely fast. You do need to be very strong. You need to be as like as heavy as you can be while still maintaining those two aspects. But a lot of it is like there's a level, high level of athleticism that it takes to go from sprinting full speed on ice to jumping into a sled and sitting down in under two seconds because that seems to be the bit where it's all of a sudden you go from like trying to be this extremely explosive powerful person and then you've got to swiftly and gracefully just insert yourself into this tiny vehicle with how many other huge dudes is it five men in it? no four four men. guys total four on guys. the sled yeah yeah it's it's a it's a ballet pretty much like we will spend hours just in a garage with the sled just sitting there learning how to like hop in the right way and do it as fast as we can because when you're on ice like there's grooves that are cut for like maybe the first 30 meters but then outside that groove is where we actually kind of load into the sled and if you don't go in smooth and like you can knock the sled left or right and that could mean like a tenth off your time at the bottom which is going to be the difference between like first place and 15th place could be a tenth of a second so there's no like cool running style bathtub scenes where everyone's in the tub and you sort of go on side to side with a bit of water? <laughs> no, no, no. The closest uh, we would get to that is like you'll see pilots uh, up at the track and some of them will have their eyes closed. You see them kind of just doing all this mm. weird kind of swaying around and it, they call it mine runs. So like in their head, they're just actually going down the track. So all the guys that are going to be pushing – they're just kind of like getting amped up and ready and jumping around and you see the pilot just quiet by himself doing all this kind of stuff and then he's just <laughs> like, all right, I'm ready and then walks outside. So would you say it sort of staggers from the most uh, athletic at the back of the sled, so last in the sled up until the pilot at the front of the sled and but he needs to be the most skillful? The pilot definitely is probably the most skillful because bringing that sled down the track is definitely the hardest part like you've got a time like well we could be going 155 plus kilometers an hour and he's got to maintain this thing that weighs 600 kilos on all four runners the whole way through um the way that we usually do it like the guys on the side are usually a bit bigger and like they're super powerful because they're going to be the ones kind of like knocking that thing off the start mm. The guy that's in the back is probably your fastest guy because he's going to be running the longest. So, And he's also got to be strong because as he continues running, there's another guy hopping in, there's another guy hopping in. So yeah. his sled is actually getting heavier as he's pushing. So th there's a balance of like finding out where you work the best with other people, what combination of three guys kind of work well with this pilot. And But, yeah, like I, I usually did the two spot, which is the guy that sits right behind the pilot. So I'm really good at getting the sled off the line and then I run the shortest amount and then I hop in and then the guy on the right side, he takes maybe two to four steps off me and then he hops in and then another two to four steps off that, you got the guy in the back. So he's, from the time I load to the guy, the guy in the back loads, he's probably taking eight total steps maybe, but that's all happening in well under a second and we're all trying to sit down, stay still and then just go for a ride. It's magic to watch. Like I really enjoy the Winter Olympics and especially like the sled events. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things that I'm always tuning in for. Can you comment on like in weightlifting, that's my sport that I'm pretty shit at, but it's the sport I've committed to. We've got obviously like <laughs> people talk about the Chinese style of weightlifting and then more, I guess, like the Eastern European style, sort of Middle Eastern style, you know, picking up the feet a lot more rather than sliding them. Do you see these cultural differences in bobsled or is it so refined that everyone's just figured out there is one way to do this thing and you're just trying to do it slightly better than the other team or are there guys that hop in in different sequences maybe they keep more guys out of the sled for longer yeah you do you do see different countries have different kind of techniques on what they like to do um some pilots for example there's 
uh, a Korean guy that he won't start on his push bar. He'll actually start back where the, the brakeman is at. Oh, and like run hit up it. And hit, yeah, and then run up and hit his sled um, rather than standing there and just kind of waiting for it to go. Some pilots like to do that. Uh, you'll see, like, the Germans. Um, most everybody, when they're doing four-man, it, it'll go pilot, left guy, right guy, back guy. And then the Germans do an opposite version with one of their sleds. So they'll actually go right side first, left side second, then the guy in the back. What do they know that um, we don't? Yeah. They, the Germans know a lot that we don't because they win a lot of races. So mm. maybe we should start switching some things around. But like people's technique is a lot different too. You'll see different countries. Like everybody's cadence is different. Everybody's hit is a little bit different. And the way they transition from like that first step to like sprinting down the ice is slightly different. So you do see like cultural differences on sleds uh, with terms of like pushing and loading and, and how they drive. And in terms of the equipment, I imagine obviously there's some sort of standardization, like people don't want you hanging off like all these spoilers and things like that. But how much differences do you see between the teams there in terms of the design of the vehicle? The designs of the sleds, there's, there's really, there's maybe three to four different types of sleds that are out there. There's not like a huge amount that are different. Um, The biggest difference are like the Germans have a company that only makes their sleds. They don't make anybody else's sleds in the world where there's a company called BTC where they'll make sleds for anybody that pays. So there's standardized equipment. Like the sleds have to weigh a minimum of a certain amount of weight and they can't be any heavier than like 700 kilos when everybody's in there's like they can't be a certain length they they have to be a certain width like everything's pretty standard mm. the the one thing i would think everybody kind of does differently is the the actual steering for the pilot like the the setup inside the nose that actually steers the sled is probably hugely different between country to country and then the actual runners that are on the ice um every team and every pilot and every country will kind of prep those runners a little bit differently uh, to, to, to basically make them as smooth as possible and have them slide across the ice as fast as possible. So you'll see different things like that. But for the most part, it's a very standardized sport where they try to level that playing field as much as possible. And what's like, is the footwear similar to a track spike? Like, or is it longer spikes, shorter spikes, but more? It's similar to a track spike. Um, I actually got a set here. Let me grab a, awesome. uh, a shoe for you real quick. His mate's staying very composed. Obviously, it's a good night game. Yeah, good night of gaming going on. There's a lot going yeah, on he behind can. you. He goes hard. So, Adidas is the only company that makes these. So, this is the oh, yeah. the spike. Not it unlike cool. the uh, Michael Johnson had those a similar with the zip at the front and the laces on the inside, but obviously a stronger exactly. plate. Yeah, so they're super stiff, but then I don't know if you guys can see this. Yeah. Rather than having like eight spikes, we ah, have a great it's like a rose. little yeah. needle that are kind of in there. But other than that, I mean, it's just kind of like a track spike mm. for the rest of it, other than then this part here. And they're fairly stiff in terms of like sprint spikes and stuff like that. And do you wear those on a track just to get used to them? You didn't, I didn't really need to get used to them. Like if you do a lot of like off season sprinting with your spikes on, mm. uh, as soon as you put these on they're they're a bit tighter and they're a little bit more rigid. But once you start like running on ice, it feels like, just any kind of other sprinting you would do on a track. Mm. And when you're running on the ice, does it feel similar to a track or is it more like sprinting on concrete? Yeah, it'd be pretty rough, right? It's softer than concrete a little bit, um, but it is a little bit harder than like on like a Mondo track or, mm. or something like that. It's a, it's a bit in between the two. Yeah, interesting. And so now, obviously, I can't imagine your year-round access to obviously bobsledding because of the seasons. Are you like he break down? I guess an off season weeks training and then an in season weeks training. Like how much you're sprinting? I can't imagine you're doing a heap of longer speed endurance stuff. Yeah, uh, off season, like uh, just what I've been doing for maybe the past couple months leading up to like our preseason type stuff is like Mondays uh, is more upright mechanics. So we'll do like wickets and build up sprints and different things like that. Uh, Tuesday or like lifting on Mondays is usually uh, more lower body focus, clean squats, uh, accessory work for your lower body. Tuesday has been maybe 
uh, some endurance work to just kind of build capacity. And then uh, what, what sort types. of capacity are we trying to build here? Is it like sort of 100 endurance work or like 200 or even less? Uh, less than that. I would say like it would be 80 meter tempo repeats mm-hmm. uh, with, you know, maybe you're doing like a set of four uh, 80 meters and then 30 seconds rest in between each one and then take five minutes in between sets and you're okay. doing maybe four to five sets of that uh and then you have some upper body strength i'll be doing on tuesdays wednesdays we actually push here uh on the sled we have a, a dry track that has kind of like train tracks that go uh, down the center mm-hmm. of it so and then the the track itself is just like a normal sprinting track so we can do uh some pushing and loading and different techniques we'll put timing eyes out and kind of see like how fast you are from your five to 10 this week versus last week and the week before. And then Thursdays is usually a a recovery day. Uh, Just kind of do active recovery, med ball throws, or just something to kind of move around a bit. And then Friday, again, it's short sprints, maybe some acceleration work, sleds, and then we go push again. And then Saturday is kind of just hanging out and we call it upper body yoga on Saturdays because it's really us just doing a bro session in the gym. That's the, I love that name. It sounds very like yeah. um, Charlie Francis esque. The training. It is. It is. Especially yeah, with Charlie that recovery Francis day. Esque. Yeah. So the, the, the Thursday recovery days are uh, are one of my favorite, just because rather than, I don't do well with just having like a full day off, uh, especially like with coming from CrossFit coming into here, I like to kind of move around a little bit. So. We do like a med ball circuit and some core work and just like maybe bike intervals and just kind of sweat it out a little bit. Mm. How um, good is it though not having to do any like chip awards or any of that bullshit? It's just, uh, it's like you just get to do the fun stuff from CrossFit now. Exactly. So the, the, the funny part is like I still have a lot of friends in the CrossFit world and a lot of them are still training for the games and they do that. And like when I go visit them at their gym, and I'll go train there. I'll just watch them dying. And then they're watching me just doing like box jumps and cleans and all this fun Feeling stuff. Feeling good. Like, ah. Yeah. So and I watch them just doing like assault bikes and muscle ups and thrusters and burpees. I'm like, I don't really miss that that much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. It's, I've just got so many questions about bobsled because Angus and I have been trying to get a bobsled athlete on for the longest time. Yeah. And of course, most bobsled athletes don't speak much English. Uh, and then there's the great British guy. So I'm really sorry. I was just literally like months ago scrolling through the CrossFit Invictus uh, Instagram and then I saw you. I was like, this has to happen. I was like, this is our guy. <laughs> um so, how was the first competitive run? Like, again, I have to reference Cool Runnings again. Was it like the Germans were intense? This is all you have to go on. Yeah, no <laughs> one wanted to speak to you guys. Like, It's all anybody knows. Like, nobody knows a lot about Bob No, Sled but every, there's this the healthy curiosity. Yeah, it, it, and yeah. everyone knows that it attracts like a very high level of athleticism. And I even like, I love and I've loved this over the years of like guys putting out vlogs on YouTube of like how you train because it's all very, it's a good viewing and that's why I'd like to see Cool more. runnings to bobsled is like what Space Jam was to basketball. No, <laughs> no. It, it's That is 100% correct. <laughs> So, uh, in terms of like, it's not all fact. <laughs> no. No, no. Okay, so there's like bits and pieces that are probably correct, but yeah, it's that's actually the first time I've heard that. That's a great analogy. Okay, so for just to give you my idea of my fandom for Cool Runnings, I've been to Ostros Rio in Jamaica where they filmed a lot of that movie, and they have on Magic Mountain a bobsled track in the Jamaican jungle, and I've done that three times. <laughs> nice. So yeah, what was it like? That is awesome. Were the Germans the intimidated? Germans are, they're still around too. Yeah, yeah. They still slide. They they came up to Canada last year and they were up there racing. And they're still around. They must really feel the cold, those boys. Oh yeah, for sure. That's it. Everything would <laughs> yeah. just stiffen up on them. Yeah, yeah. They say. Well, you say Bolt hated running in Oslo at the Golden Spike, where apparently they threw so much cash in him he couldn't say no. <laughs> so yeah was it intimidating yeah, were would, the germans intimidating who was what was the vibe give us the rundown on so your first day my first run was in whistler like our first like official like other than doing like our team trials which is technically a race like our first my first international race was in whistler canada and it was a weird feeling 
like you're really excited but you don't know what you're excited for because you've never been down this track it's not like in football where it's like i've played a game before just not against these guys but i understand what's going to happen like every track that we went to was a different feeling but everybody was talking about whistler because whistler is notoriously like the fastest track in the world oh nice so that was for us it was just like okay our first track is the fastest track in the world and then like you get the biggest pressure at the last turn in whistler is called thunderbird uh it's a huge right hand turn and you get a lot of pressure like you get four or five g's of pressure in that and they're all talking like all the guys are talking about that turn and everything so it's just like i'm getting ready to go i'm just like I'm not really sure. I feel excited, but it's more like anxious, kind of nervous. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. And then as you're going, it was so much fun just because of how different it was from, like, our track here in Lake Placid. The one here in Placid is, is fairly rough. There's a lot of turns. It's really technical. But the one in Whistler, it's, like, big turns, big speeds. You can really feel it. So, like, as we were going down, I was actually getting more and more excited. Like, I'm ready for this last turn. And then you get – into that last turn and I just got buried. Like <laughs> one of those things like you couldn't control it. Like my stomach just kind of like pushed into my lungs. I was just, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> and then as soon as we were done, like I, I stood up, I pulled the brakes. I was like, Oh, I'm ready to do this again. Like it's finally <laughs> like, now I know what I'm excited for. Cause so, I should mic it up. Yeah. They should mic it up. Funny. Man, it was, uh, Whistler was fun, but like, and then it was like that every single stop. Cause obviously I was a rookie last year, so I've never done any of these tracks throughout Europe. So every time we were going to a new track in Europe, it's like kind of that nervous excitement. Cause you don't know what the track's going to feel like. And then you make it down and you're just, your adrenaline is as high as it's ever been. You're just ready to do it again. Who makes these tracks? Like, is it a former bobsled guy? So he has some empathy for what he's putting you through, or is it just some random engineer? Like, or is it fuck NASA? these guys. It like, sounds very high tech. <laughs> <laughs> um, the tracks themselves, like uh, all tracks, are just basically like like a concrete run, and they just build the ice onto it. Um, but a lot of them are really old. Like the one here in, in Placid is is extremely old. Um, and then like each track has its own crew that takes care of the ice. The only one that's different is the one in Saint Moritz in Switzerland. It actually is a natural track, so they don't have Ooh, cool. like a concrete setting for it. Wow. What they do is they just like bring ice up and they shave the ice into the track and they like dig holes into the ground and put the ice in there and build the track every single year. How crazy. And obviously they use it for quite a few events or is it just for like one big event? No, they have like skeleton races and luge races. Like there's a lot that goes on there. Um, but it, it's not up like all year round or anything. So I would say maybe five races throughout the year are on that track in europe is it that big where they have sort of like weekly meets that you can start at as a kid and you can see if you can make your local bobsled team and is it something people like do for a bit of fun like an amateur sport as well yeah there's countries where they have like club teams so like for like switzerland for example they they have club teams and a lot of the clubs will slide all the time in st moritz uh, in Germany, they, they have club teams and like some of these guys will start young and, on some clubs and build their way up to make the national team. Uh, there used to be club teams here in Lake Placid. There used to be like the little neighborhoods and towns that are like within a 50 square mile radius. They used to have their own club teams and all that. And it, it kind of died down in the U.S. But in Europe, you see a lot of that where some kids do grow up like looking at bobsled as like the sport that they want to do. Where in the U.S., it's more like this is somebody's like second or third sport that they are kind of gotten into later on in their career. I wonder if growing up with the sport and knowing you're going to be a professional bobsledder and having the skill component of it to train it as well as the athleticism component takes away from the end result in athleticism. Whereas for someone like yourself, you've been chasing pretty General much athleticism. athleticism for like eight years since you stopped playing football, just generally speaking. Uh, is there sort of, like, do you know how athletic and strong and fast some of the other guys are from Europe or Asia? You do. I mean, you definitely know how strong and how fast they are because um, it's pretty comparable. Like, we can go, like, time for time on the ice. But then also, like, just there's guys, like, for the Great Britain team, they've got guys that run 9 nine hundred. Mm, Joe Fearon? Like, yeah, they compete in track. Yeah. And they've got legit numbers up. And the same with uh, 
some of like the other guys in Europe, they maybe do other track meets in the off season or they do weightlifting meets in the off season. Like they're, they're very strong, very fast people, mm. which is another reason why they're very good at bobsled is because those two things kind of put together. Plus a lot of Europeans are just naturally bigger than U S people as well. Yeah. So like there's some guys that have their whole team is six foot three, 105 kilo dudes. And our guys are like, under six foot tall and we're all hovering around a hundred kilos well, and so. they've just got this tiny lightweight sled as well i guess because they've still got to somehow get under that weight limit yeah exactly yeah so that's the thing too is if you have lighter athletes you have to add weight to the sled to kind of make that minimum weight requirement um where if you have bigger athletes you can take that weight out of the sled and push a really light sled mm. and just have your weight be on the guys rather than in the sled so that that makes a difference on your starts always. How Harry Akon Zaridi hasn't been picked up in a bobsled team is just beyond me. Like the dude's a unit. He's cl- he's pretty much run, I think, a few flat tens. He surely he's been approached and he just doesn't want to do it because if you follow him on Instagram, he looks like the perfect candidate as an animal. Yeah, I'm not. I've never met him, um, but some of the Britain guys, I think, have said like they've definitely reached out to him about. Uh, coming out for bobsled i think he's on the lighter side though yeah like i think looks, you're right his legs are quite he light looks just like he's 110 kilos from a photograph mm. but i think he's like in around the 90 kilo range which and bobsled that's not gonna fly yeah it's yeah it's do just you bad. get much uh weight management across the team trying to balance out the corners of the sled like do you is does that ever become a factor or is it as long as it's generally balanced and you're within the ballpark of each other it'll be fine like what's the shuffling around like and finding the right team dynamic the weight plays a huge role um the like pilots will kind of pick and choose uh, people off of what they weigh as well as like what their times are. So is the pilot in charge that, of a lot of team selection? Cause I guess they're the one who's got to deal with it all. Right. Yeah. So for us, we, we do have like the coaches that are picking like the national team. So like we'll go through our process of trying out for the national team every year. And then the coaches are going to give a list of like, these are the 12 push athletes that make it. And then the pilots are going to say, I want this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy on my sled. And some of the factors that go into that are like how fast that they push, how well of a teammate they are, how much they weigh, because the weight plays a huge role. So if you have a lighter pilot, he's probably looking for heavier athletes. If you've got a heavy pilot, he probably doesn't care. He's probably just looking at times because he knows that the weight's going to be there. Um, so a lot of it has to go into what three guys weigh a certain amount of weight and can work well together and get into this sled and so there's there's different factors and rather than just saying okay i want the next three fastest guys because they might not be uh the best three to be pushing together yeah because you want them having like similar cadence and everything like that and like stride length we'll get pretty funky trying to balance it yeah and usually like you'll have your heavier guys like a little bit closer to the pilot so like for example, on the sled that I was on most of the year last year, I was probably closer to the heaviest guy. So I was, that's another reason why I was sitting right behind the pilot is because that weight being up front is going to make it easier for him to control mm. rather than having like all the weight in the very back. Yeah. Then that steering is going to be a little slightly different. So they probably take that into account when they're talking about like who they want to take for here and there for different uh, sleds. Mm. Yeah. Blaine, going back from a, and sorry to sort of go back and forth between so much bobsled stuff, going back to more of a technical sprinting standpoint, uh, obviously there's your drive to fly phase when let's say you're running 100. I, it doesn't appear that there's much of a fly phase when it comes to pushing the sled, but can you explain like the phase of the acceleration to when you are in the sled? Yeah, so if you think of it like 100, when you're in the blocks and you come out, like you really are thinking drive. Like you want to get your knee up and your foot behind you driving back. It's the same thing with the sled. Um, our body angles might be slightly different just because like handles are in the way and different things. But really, you want to drive for that first 10 to 15 meters. Uh, the timing eye that doesn't actually start until uh, the 15 meter mark. So we'll be pushing off and by the time we get to 15 meters, then the nose crosses the time, and that's when, like, it'll start counting down the, the time for the, the whole run. But the, the way that most tracks will go is, like, you have a flat part that you get the sled moving, and then it starts going down. So 
even though it may not look like we're in like full upright mechanics, when you're trying to push a sled downhill and it's gaining speed, if you're not in full upright mechanics and like sprinting, then that sled's going to get away from you a lot faster. So like our body angles are slightly different because like we're hunched over kind of pushing, but we're really thinking about like getting tall and sprinting behind this sled rather than staying driving and letting the sled kind of get away from us at that point. Yeah, that's now knowing that you do have that 15 meters sort of grace period before the uh, timer starts, it does seem like a really odd tactic to charge into the thing. It does, yeah. So, yeah. and then every track is also different, like in terms of like how that crest is, uh, like how close the crest is from the start, how steep that crest is. So there are different tracks where like your strategy for your start might be slightly different. Oh, okay. So they, they'll shift it around based on the course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Also, just from the you were mentioning the G's when you go around a particularly tight corner. If one of your boys in the back passes out, does that affect the pilot and his ability to keep this thing on the tracks? Or are you packed in like sardines? So even if you pass out, you'll be held in position. I don't know if anybody's actually passed out, but we are really tight in there. So if somebody did pass out, then, I mean, you're probably not going to notice it right away. The pilot's definitely not going to notice it. Like the run from start to finish, it's less than a minute. So if somebody passes out and they come back to it, like they might not actually know that they actually passed out because how fast the run is. But as far as I know, last year, nobody passed out during a run or anything like that. I mean, you can get kind of like a little woozy inside if you aren't holding yourself still and you kind of hit your head against the wall back and forth um but for the most part those three guys in the back want to stay like as still as possible so that pilot can steer as much as possible because if you got three guys bouncing back and forth then he's definitely going to feel it yeah oh man it sounds like the most hectic sport and like i said i've always loved watching it but i want to see it live and Maybe one day, if I ever win the lottery, I'll get myself up to Switzerland for a year. And When's the Angus next and I winter, can join a, join a bobsled team. Winter Olympics will be 2022. Yeah. Who, who's hosting In Beijing. That? Beijing. Oh, cool. So, just that same time zone as Australia. Maybe we can get up there and go sideline. Yeah, China's pretty close. Yeah, very close. Anyway, let's get into the CrossFit side of things now. Uh, so, obviously, you're coaching at Invictus. What sort of, like, how much time do you have with the athletes each week? Because they've got quite elite teams there, from what I understand. They do have uh, a lot of good athletes over at Invictus. When I was there uh, on site, um, we would have the elite guys come in from maybe like 8.30 to 9, and they would be there till about 11. And they would usually be doing like their morning aerobic sessions or depending on what a specific athlete needs, uh, they might be doing something different. But usually – on the aerobic side of stuff, longer workouts, running intervals, rowing intervals, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we they get a break from 11, they come back in around one or two, and that's where your like, more traditional style like CrossFit session would be. So like they're weightlifting, they do their Metcons, they do their accessory work and all that. Uh, even with the teams, the teams kind of do their own individual thing in the off season. And then as we start getting closer to like competitions then teams kind of get back together and they start doing more training sessions together. So like their morning sessions might be more like team based interval work or team based kind of like longer events that they might see in a, in a competition. And then the afternoon, the teams will have like their, their team style events where we have worms and we have all the different kind of, uh, like team implements you might see at the games and we kind of throw those at them. Um, but other than that, like everybody is a really tight knit group there at Invictus. So even though you might be training as an individual, like the atmosphere and the training kind of environment that Invictus has created there uh, is really second to none. And it's really cool to see so many high level athletes just being so down to earth and just being there to train with other people and just hang out and it's really a, a really cool community to be a part of mm. but i guess that's the thing like when you get an invite onto one of the teams at crossfit invictus i feel like you'd instantly recognize that you're part of something that's bigger than yourself exactly yeah and it, and to get invited i would say to get invited on a team at invictus it also shows a lot of like your character because cj and Tino, uh, the two guys that kind of run the show at Invictus, CJ owns Invictus, and Tino 
helps out with a lot of the the programming and the coaching of the athletes. And if they reach out and say, hey, we want you to be on a team, I think it speaks volumes to like the type of character that that person would be because they don't just offer those spots to anybody and they won't just offer it to you if you're just a great athlete but a shit human. They're not going to be like, hey, come hang out and train with us. Like You've got to have both an elite level of fitness and physical ability, but you have to be an elite level person for them to really want to keep you around and, and have you be a part of their brand. Yeah. I guess, How long do you think before Rogue produces some sort of grass bobsled? Yeah. Man, if they did, they better bring us out for the demo team or something because <laughs> that would be fun. Or they just go, uh, CrossFit Games are in winter this year up at Lake Placid and everything. There's goes, so many Fuck. things I want them to explore. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot that I want them to do. Because I see so. they're starting to... Were they dabbling in shooting for a bit? Like clay pigeon shooting? I saw I saw Tia they Toomey like with a, a rifle in her hands and I was like, all right. <laughs> they did a biathlon for the Rogan bite this year. So they had to do... I think it was like ski erg and then shooting for one of the events at the Rogan <laughs> chaos. bite. It is chaos. Yeah. Australia, would, you'd, be, you'd be running into some legalities if you did that down under. It'd be like, they could yeah. mix it up with throwing a bit of rowing and then throwing a, a boomerang. boomerang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, mind you, is probably more dangerous. I almost lost an arm when my uncle threw a boomerang at me as a kid. But that would be sick. Like, I want CrossFit, like, because you know how they're separating it into more country based now. Um, yeah. They're having different events. I would like to see more like of the domestic cultural influence on each event. Like, you know, mm, make yeah. it more Australian sports focused, lots of beach and lots of open water swimming when they come to Australia. And then maybe in Eastern Europe, more sort of strongman based or like strength based or yeah. even like road cycling and things like that. I would love that. I think that was one thing I actually wanted to see. Like, I was hoping like, even when, like, let's say World's Strongest Man, when they travel, they used to travel around do, like, their events everywhere. They would mm -hmm. have, like, a cultural-type event um, wherever the country was at. And, like, I was really hoping, because they had that uh, competition in Cape Town, South Africa. I was really, like, even if it wasn't strictly, like, a cultural event, but just have, like, an African-type vibe to one of the events yeah. or, or do something. And I think more countries are going to start doing something like that because it'll be kind of like a, hey, choose my event over theirs type deal. So And the home team advantage. Kind of getting more popular. I think people are going to start having more more of a, uh, I guess, kind of a diversity of their exact event that goes on. Yeah, like turn up to South Africa and there's a big cage in front of you and their lion walks out. They're like, wrestle it. <laughs> Get it back in the cage. A rogue lion, of course. Yeah, you just he's got like a heart, rogue weight vest on, <laughs> personalized. <laughs> How would you train? Man, that would be awesome. How would you train for that? <laughs> you just um, I think you just try to make it quick. Run. You just run, run at the line with your neck outstretched, and you try to eye gouge it so it finishes you quick. Yeah. <laughs> No, you don't want to suffer on that one. Yeah, yeah you want to so, go that quick. Do you ever see yourself fully retiring from competitive sport? Because is that sort of what's happened? You've been like, all right, I'm done for a bit, but then you sort of get the itch again? Oh, man, it's hard to say now because I'm not thinking about retiring now. Like, the only thing I'm really thinking about now is like we've got world champs next year coming up at our home track, so we want to do well this year to kind of set us up for that. Mm. And then we got the Olympics. Um I mean, eventually I'll retire in some form or another. Like, I'm always going to train. Uh, whether I keep training for strength or if I go back to CrossFit is my, like, my main style of training, whatever it is. Like, I'll do something. But I don't think long-term competitiveness for me is sustainable just with the amount of, like, punishment that you kind of go through yeah. doing CrossFit and then, like, a different type of punishment that you go through with bobsled. Like, I'll probably do, like, a more sustainable version that'll be able to kind of maintain throughout just training. Man, there's a lot of 40-year-olds um, doing well in uh, powerlifting. Mm. I know it's not the most there exciting are. sport, but as far as something with some, like, chance of, like, serious longevity. There is, yeah. And that's, like, what I've always thought is, like, I can be strong and explosive up to a certain point, and then once the explosive side starts going away and I don't want to do as much plyometric training and I don't want to do all that kind of stuff, like powerlifting is always going to be something like it's going to be a part of my training. Like I still do uh, the like main powerlifting movements now, um, but I don't compete in them. I think that'll always be a staple in my training throughout. I actually joked with my, with my wife and told her 
by the time I'm done uh, doing any kind of competitive fitness, I'm just going to get that big power belly and just be squatting 300 kilos. 100%. <laughs> what are your squat bench did at the moment, Blaine? Uh, squats 260. My dead, last time I did it was 300. Nice. Uh, my my bench, honestly, I've ne- I don't max out my bench ever. I don't know what it, it's my worst lift out of all my lifts is my bench press. What are you doing for a set of five? maybe like 130 it's i don't not know not, not very much at all you're talking to a couple of guys who are praying yeah. to get two plates at sight yeah, like, yeah really yeah. <laughs> like we yes everyone like we've had so many athletes on SU and they're like yeah they talk down their bench, bench and we're like much. you can feel comfortable in yeah. our circle like my i i my go-to is i just whack a 20 each side and i go i'm gonna take this bad boy for a ride as long as as long as you can go bar straight to 60 kilos then you're a man <laughs> It's true. And then you're off the hook. <laughs> it's all good. You don't need to show anyone anymore. You're like, look, we're just keeping it sub-maximal. Sub-maximal is the best way to train for bench press. I think we can all agree on that. So you're just like, look, mate, sub-max yeah. boys here. I'm comparing my bench to some of the numbers that we have here. You go, and- give us some numbers of the big boys. The real nah, guys. CrossFitters aren't really benching well, we that heavy. Ha- no, he's talking about bobsled. Our record board here, uh, I think the, the guy on the top is two bench 210. Oh, okay. Jesus. That's hectic. Uh, and he does cross like 198. And then my roommate actually just got third place. What did you bench? 185? Yeah. Yeah, he benched 185. That's hectic. And that's third place on the record board. Is 210 a bit excessive for CrossFit? Like, should that guy be focusing elsewhere at this point? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's big pants, that's what you need. Like, excuse me, sir. Can you just fucking go yeah, do he a gets it. He's, his initial push is with his chest and arms. He gets that thing going. Who yeah. who have we got there, Blaine? Does he need a shout out on the High Performance Podcast? Is he a bobsledder? Oh, he's a bobsledder. Yeah, we're at. I'm at the training center. Yeah, right Angus, I was the bobsled. I wasn't the CrossFit. Sorry, center. I thought you were talking about CrossFit Invictus. No, no, no. Oh no, CrossFit Invictus bench press. Yeah, you'd be I'm top dog there. Yeah, I'm winning that one for sure. Yeah, nice. All right, so, all right. My, my roommate. He's actually he was a rookie with me last year. We went through the combine together in California. Nice. Uh, we went. through team trials together we ended up both making the national team our rookie year last year and then we ended up being on the same sled for world championships last year as well so it was really cool kind of like he and i have gone through basically the whole process side by side his name's kyle shout out kyle uh, shout out to kyle kyle Kyle, what's your ig for the punters listening you don't want his ig (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Kyle has an ID. He's, he never posts on it. All right, all right. Ne- never in his life. But just a browser. Yeah, he's a lurker. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Tell him to show love to the hard. He's just got it to spy on the Germans. Yeah. See what they're up to. Keep the bench yeah, numbers comparable. <laughs> all right. We go get into our scripted questions now. Playing and I sent out the question is who are your five favorite athletes of all time? All right. So I was thinking about this for a little bit. So I'll go five down to one. Nice. So. My fifth is Michael Vick. Solid. Just the guy. because, yeah, he, watching him play football was probably one of the most exciting things ever to watch. And I wasn't an Atlanta Falcons fan or anything, but it was one of those things where it's like, as soon as he was on TV, like, you go you go and watch his game. And just watching him do some of the stuff he was doing was ridiculous. Mm. In Madden 04, um, he was a cheat code. Like, that was the first Madden I ever got, and he was, Madden was 05, just... Madden 05, he was on the front cover. Madden 05, sorry. Yeah, he's, yeah, you couldn't stop him. I would always play with him, and I didn't even like the Falcons. Yeah. I would just beat him because you could just, if you wanted to pass it, you could, but if not, you knew you were just going to run That's it for right. 75 yards. Yeah. Uh, number four would be Ken Griffey Jr. Solid. Nice. So... Growing up in the Seattle area, he was always obviously probably the biggest star in like the 90s when it comes to Seattle sports area. And just Griffey was was Griffey. It was just really cool to watch him play baseball. Uh, from there, number three would be Vince Carter. Yeah, nice. So still going, yeah, still doing one, the rounds. Yeah, still going. He's been playing. I what was it? If he plays one game. In the year 2020, is the only person to play in four decades or something like that, wow. or three decades. That's madness. I think three decades. Yeah. yeah. No, no, Which no. Is, four. You're right. Sorry, 90s, early 2000s, teens, and then 20s. Yeah, you're right. Four. Yeah, we've been playing four different decades, which is absurd. That is. And then, 
was that three? Yeah. So he's also played through like if you look at the hormone profiles of all the guys he's played against, he has just been through every stage as well. Yeah, <laughs> in terms of like the crazy era of baseball, like he survived. No, no, we're talking about basketball. Oh, basketball. Isn't Sorry, a Sorry, I do not fan. follow me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the nah, US. Roads don't really help with basketball. Yeah. <laughs> no, they don't. They're not going to grow you a foot taller. Yeah, not yet. No, no. Uh, my top two are fairly similar. Uh, so number two would be Deion Sanders. Yeah, nice. He's a bit two sport athlete like yourself. Three? No, you're a three sport yeah. athlete. Three sport now, yeah. Uh, and then number one is Bo Jackson. Oh, the fucking uh, goat! His documentary where he comes back from his, I think, one of his knee surgeries and he's shooting the bow and arrow with his feet. The stories are crazy. Yeah. And those two guys, those two are number one and two just because, like, the two-sport athlete thing is ridiculous. Mm. Like, being able to do NFL and play in the MLB at the same time is nuts. Mm. And then Bo did it while also being just a straight unit yeah. of a human being, which is why he's a little bit over Dion in my book because he's probably just as fast as Dion, but probably 20 kilos heavier than him. Mm. And just like he's the, if anyone hasn't watched that ESPN 30 for 30 on Bo Jackson, or if you don't know who Bo Jackson is, you got to do yourself a favor and punch that into YouTube because it is extremely Absolutely. entertaining. So it's on YouTube? Yeah, it's good. Like it's, it's a few years old now, I think. And it's like, it's good. Check it out. Angus, do you want to hit playing with the next question? Good top five, by the way. Do like you have it. a party trick? I don't. Not one. A, I used to. I feel like no, you could I'm run not. through a gyp rock wall. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, People probably I'm don't not want that. More parties yeah. If I do that though. Yeah, <laughs> true. All right. That's a one trick. That's a one trick for the party. Just do one it one time. You're not back. Yeah, when you need to make a speedy exit, you just give the wall a quick knock to make sure there's no supportive beams in the way. <laughs> then bust it right through. Hundred percent. All right. Then uh, the next question is the sure challenge, and it is: if I could turn back time, what is one thing I would change? Oh. I don't know. I, I I mean, people have asked me that kind of question. Like, I do, like, Instagram Q&As, mm. and people have always asked that. And I've never, like, been able to, like, pinpoint something because, in my mind, like, I don't know, like, the domino effect of changing one thing could be. So, like, I could say, like, I go back in time and, like, I'd like to change maybe my college career slightly and maybe it would have came out a different way. But then maybe if that happened, like, I wouldn't have met my wife because I probably wouldn't have done CrossFit. And the only reason I met her is because I was doing CrossFit. Like, I really enjoy my life and where I'm at right now. So, like, I don't see anything I can go back and say I'd like to change that. CrossFit's... In my mind, like, that could knock something else over and my whole life would be different. CrossFit's definitely a good spot to find a wife because you know they're going to be reasonably in shape, got some solid life skills. You can sort of see where it's heading. Yeah. All right, well, Angus, that means because Blaine doesn't regret anything, what's something? We've, when so our, our uh, guests don't regret saying we both have to say something we've regretted. What's uh, yours this moving week? into a nice. house with six students. No, you've that used that before. Bad idea. Have I used that before? Yeah, yeah, yeah new one. Uh, I regret the last two years of my music career. It led to very few album sales and getting sued. Okay, uh, for me... Oh, I reheated some bad chicken last week and then I put it back in the fridge and I reheated it again and it went off and I had the runs for two days. Nice. What are you weighing at the moment? Do I weigh more than you now? I'm 83. I'm 84. Yes. All right, next question. Uh, What is that? Oh, are you into the rap scene much? Do you like the hip hop music? Yeah. Who is a rapper you would have rap about you and what would they say? Oh, that's a good question. I see you've got the the bleached hair. That's a very in look in the in the rap scene. That's no, very OG Eminem. Yeah, that is a little bit of little is. peep. Even I, I think I would choose. Man, I grew up listening to like West Coast rap. Nice. So if I think it would be like along the lines of Dr. Dre. Nice. Or like, I like the West Coast kind of like funk hip hop type. Nice, uh, like real instrumentation sort of stuff. Yeah, nice. it's like some of the stuff that Kendrick still does now that I like. So I would say I like probably Kendrick, and he whatever he could come up with. I think if he just said my name in any version, then I mean you, that's a win in my book. Multi-sport Regardless, athlete, there's a bit to work with. No, I, I'd say he's um he would say that Blaine's is athletic, more athletic than most brothers. Maybe I think that would be it. Oh, 
That's it. Man, that would be that would be a compliment. Yeah, that's. I think that's I'd it. That. How he would wrap that in there, I think we'd have to leave that. Angus, you're the musician here. Mate, you I, got any I what didn't write. I wrote like two lyrics the whole time I was in the band. Okay, okay. <laughs> Useless. <laughs> oh, there you go, mate. I've learned so much. Though. I think I've learned. We've had some like really sp- a lot of coaches on the show, but just as far as like Bob Sled and that, I've been waiting f- to get someone on like yourself for a long, long time. Now and I know enough that when I'm at a party and I'm a, yeah. a, a drink. <laughs> Drinking a lot next, and I can talk about bobsled like I really know it to someone who knows nothing about yeah. it. So that's what I'm most yeah. stoked about. I'll just be like, Yeah, so they standardize the vehicle, and you've got 15 meters before they really hit the timer. And that's when you really <laughs> want to like push into it and start sending boys into the sled. And I'll just be like, Oh, cool. And then I'll come in and say, But you see, the crest of each course changes from course to course. So you've yeah. got to really time your run so you're up nice and high, floating, keeping up with the sled. So there down. you go, mate. You've educated it. What before we let you go, a uh, shout out to your eyes. That right there sounds like you guys know everything about the <laughs> Dude, get I'm ready to be a pilot. I know how it works. <laughs> All right, Blade, before we let you go, and again, thanks for your time. We appreciate it a lot. Uh, shout out your IG, uh, if you've got a YouTube channel, programs, sponsors, what you got upcoming, anything. Let everyone know. Man, uh, IG is just Blaine McConnell. Uh, Blaine underscore McConnell. That's where I probably do most of my social media. I don't have a YouTube, although that's probably coming in the future. No, I would like to see training. some training vlogs. Yeah. I kill a lot of time watching, like, uh, Kevin Mayer's training vlog, and I would like to see something a bit more strength based. Mm. Yeah. So okay. So here's here's the plan of what I've got going on. I have a program that I run through Invictus called Athletic Essentials. Um, you can go sign up for that. It's usually like twelve week cycles, but it's kind of like the training that I like to do. So it's strength based with plyometrics and being explosive and all that kind of stuff. There's some sprints thrown in there as well. Uh, ideally, what I would like to do is take that program from something that people have to pay for and put it on to like a YouTube channel where all you can do is like just click subscribe and watch it and get the workouts for free. Uh, so like that's the long-term goal is like uh, when I probably retire from sport, I'm going to take that program and just kind of crush it and not let people pay for it and just say, all you have to do is support me on this different Avenue that allows you to get this program for free. And then also like watch me do the whole program as well. So that's kind of on the back burner for a couple years down the road. So, but as of right now, like the type of training that I do through Invictus is the Athletic Essentials program. Uh, we run 12 week cycles throughout the year, and you can hit up CrossFitInvictus.com and go sign up for that. Uh, and then other than that, sponsors Kill Cliff is going to be supporting me through the season leading up to the the Olympics and. They've really been backing behind me, and they're really supportive of kind of like that American dream type thing. Uh, so shout out to Hillcliff. Uh, and other than that, that's that's me, I guess. Nice, mate. Again, thanks for your time today, Blade. Guys, make sure you uh, check him out. It's You're a good follow on IG. Yeah, it's very uh, solid. Yeah, good com- Sorry? I said very solid. Yeah, very solid. Yeah. All right, guys, there you go. Any last words, mate? Nah, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, thank good you man. very much.